Water, 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 water. water. Let me tell you, this fun run was no fun at all. Where, where's the water? Oh, I need to drink the water so bad. Five miles into this race, someone pushed me into a spiky plant that only Florida grows in. I tumbled down into a ditch. And, oh my goodness, this is not fun. What can I? Well, I need some water. Oh, I just died of thirst. Where's the water? You know, I could have finished this race if they hadn't dragged me to the first aid station, they spent an hour trying to bandage me up, and now I have to wait and train a whole nother year. I need a drink so bad. Wait, wait, oh, my gym bag, my gym bag. I'm sure I have some in here. Water, what? Not in that one. Water, 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 water. Oh, I need a drink so bad. <laughs> A well, while later. Okay, all right, let's see. Ah, here we go. Smart water. I don't need to be smart, I just need a drink. <laughs> let's see. Oh, here, oh, here, here's an, I know I packed a good one. Let's see. Power water. I don't need power, I need a drink. Oh my goodness. Let's see. Fruit water. Who would drink sweet, yucky food when you're dying of thirst? Oh, there's got to be something in here. Let's see. Oh. Distilled water? I use that for my iron. I know I'm a wrinkly mess, but I'm not getting out my iron. Oh, there just has to be some kind of water here. I mean, where's the water that God made? You know, it's not filled with frou-frou stuff like this. You know, and it's pure, and it's fresh, and it's refreshing, and life-sustaining. And it's free. This water costs a fortune. I mean, you know, the, the rain from heaven that comes down. Plants don't have to buy water. Animals don't have to buy water. So I don't think I have to be wa buy water. The Bible says that God rained down water on man. So I, I want water. Good, fresh, clean water. It's so important to us. Oh my goodness, let me see. There's got to be some water. Oh, at last. Oh, at last. Oh, hardly. Mm. Oh, that's so good. <coughs> this is pure good water. <laughs> that race, the race wasn't bad. It was falling into the plant. Oh. <laughs> well, water is so important to our bodies. I bet you didn't realize this, but our whole bodies are practically made of water. Water helps your joints to move. It helps your brain to think. It helps your heart to beat. It regulates your body temperature. And it helps your skin retain that moist, beautiful, wonderful glow. We all want it. it. It's just, we're just, our tissues are made up of water. Plasma is 92% water. Do you believe that? And um, muscle tissue is 80% water. Red blood cells are 69% water. Well, we're just water, water, water. Does that mean I'm a drip? <laughs> I'll worry about that one later. <laughs> but you can go a whole month without food and still survive. But you can only go one week without water and you croak right then. So you've got to have your water. God's water, the pure natural water, is so satisfying too. Well, you know. There's a lot in the Bible about water, but I remember one really important story. Yeah, here it is. Um, in the book of John, it's about the Samaritan woman. Maybe you remember that story. She met Jesus at the well, and he told her about an amazing water, this living water. He said it is so amazing that one drink, and she would never thirst again. Never. I can just imagine how she must have felt. I don't have to draw that water up from the well anymore. And I don't have to keep drinking all day. 
Well, he didn't really mean that. I don't think he meant that he was going to give her water to quench her dry, thirsty throat. I think he was offering himself to quench the dry, empty heart she had. He told her that, you know, well, if she, she just needed to drink out of the source of that water. And Jesus said if she did drink that living water, that it would, well, it would be like a spring welling up into eternal life. Oh, wow. You know, um, a few minutes ago, I really needed this water to quench the thirst of my body. But I've already had a drink of the living water, his salvation. So I'm going to have to go to the well to get water and refill many times in my life. But I only need to drink of the living water once. And that help, that makes me a member of God's family. So, today, you need a drink? Or do you need a drink? Amen. Let's pray. This morning, our lesson is entitled, Thirst Quenchers. And I want to share this with you, that the book of Psalms, I've come to discern, is indeed a reservoir filled with savory songs to meditate upon. As I pray, as I sing, or as I speak the song, it, it lifts my soul towards God and he meets me where I am. Now this being this morning a women's study, I want to just draw your attention just quickly to Psalms 131. Here's another short chapter you can memorize, only three it's only three verses long. And this little chapter here is taken from the Psalms of Ascent, that collection. And uh, this psalm here depicts a mother seated with her small <coughs> child who does not appear cranky or fidgety. But you'll see here the child sits calmly, quietly, and peacefully resting securely in his mother's lap. Now with this picture in mind, listen to the words of David. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful or profound for me. But I still and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh, Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. Isn't that beautiful, lady? Mm -hmm. This is a picture of God's invitation to his restless children. With open arms, our Heavenly Father invites us to come away and find rest in him, or just for no other reason, just to sit in his presence and be close to him. And hear him whisper, be still, my child, and know that I am God. You will find peace in his presence. You see, in the Hebrew thought, to come into the presence of God means to seek his face. To come face to face with the Lord who longs to fellowship with us and desires for us to draw nearer to him. I believe this morning one of the greatest truths in the Bible is that we can experience the presence of the Lord. My question this morning is this. Do you thirst for intimacy with him? And if you come away this morning with only one thought, I pray it be this. I hope it saturates your soul. Listen. You are as close to God as you want to be. Amen. Be a thirst for intimacy with God. I'm going to base this lesson, Thirst Quencher, on two Psalms. Psalm 63 and Psalm 42. Psalm 42 is composed by a descendant of Korah. Now who was Korah? 
during the period of Israel's wandering through the wilderness, Korah led a rebellion against the authority of Moses and Aaron, so God's judgment fell on him, and he was swallowed up by the earth. But his sons were not troublemakers. They were not swallowed up, but they later became music makers. The descendants of Korah. They were the sons of Korah. Korah's descendants became prominent in temple service during the reign of David and Solomon. Some of his descendants were doorkeepers. They worked with the financial aspects of the temple. Others were worship leaders. Some were singers. Many were composers. And it continued this down their line for generations to come, for many, many years after David. Twelve psalms are ascribed to the sons of Korah. So Psalm 63 is written by David. Psalm 42 by a descendant of Korah. I'm going to parallel these two psalms that were composed by two different authors. All right, so be prepared to flip back and forth this morning. They were written 100, hundreds of years apart, yet we're going to find they have many similarities. Through the lyrics, we'll find that they are both far from the comfort of their own homes, both in trying situations, both oppressed by an enemy of some sort, but they both have the same desire, a thirst for intimacy with God. So are you ready to pour over God's word this morning? Psalm 63 we're going to begin with. Psalm 63. Written by who? David. David. When? He was in the desert of Judah. Now why is the king hiding in the desert again? All right? We learned from our study last week. He was a young fugitive. He had been for 10 years running from King Saul. Now, in the context of background of this song, he's a king. He's King David. He's now middle-aged. And he's seeking refuge from his own son, Absalom. You'll read about it in 2 Samuel chapter 15. Now, may, to just make this long story short, King David was experiencing some health issues. Right? And he wasn't as readily available to the people as usual. So one of his sons took advantage of the situation. Absalom was known to work the crowds like a celebrity. You know, in women's eyes, he was Prince William. I mean, Prince Charming, you see. <laughs> he was the crown prince. And his popularity grew, and so were his aspirations to be king. So he led a revolt against his own father, and he hired bounty hunters. So David must have thought now, middle age, oh boy, here we go again. Haven't I been through this before? I'm just too old for this. Thankfully, this period of time was only for a brief number of years or time. Nevertheless, he was forced to seek refuge again, and God was with him, because God showed his faithfulness in the past. God was with him in the present. David was assured that God was for him, and God was with him. You see. So listen to the prayer. Here, David is hiding in the wilderness. He's seeking refuge in the middle of the night. He's watching out for his enemy. And I want us to read this prayer that he calls out to God in the middle of the night. And I'd like you to follow along and read it out loud if you'd like to. The first, just the first eight verses. All right? Since this is a prayer, let's say this like we're saying a prayer to God, as David would say. All right, so would you read this along with me, verses 1 to 8. O oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you, in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary, and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied with the riches of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through watches of the night. 
because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Oh, I am going to favor that. I'm going to pray that. Isn't that beautiful? These mm -hmm. words. We can pray these words and lift them up to the Lord. Now, follow along as I read the closing of this prayer. Listen, what he says. Verse 9 through 11. They who seek my life will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God, and all who swear by God's name will praise him, while the mouth of liars will be silenced. Well, my goodness, what happened to David here? I know it's getting late, right? He sounds vindictive, doesn't he? This psalm here is an example of the kind that stirs up a lot of controversy because people find these words hard to swallow. You see, in graphic language here, he's calling on God to go after his enemies. Lord, you get them and you get them good. You know? In Psalms 3, it's another psalm that he prayed when he was, he was around this time frame. And listen what he says in Psalms 3. He says, you are a shield around me, O Lord. You are the lifter of my soul. Deliver me, O God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw and break the teeth of the wicked, praise the Lord. You see? This is an imprecation. This is a prayer for something bad to happen to an enemy. We call these imprecatory prayers, and I've listed for you other examples of these. How do you explain this, right? Now here's how I would explain it. They're living in a time of war. God's chosen people were looking for justice and peace on earth. And you cannot have peace without putting down unrighteousness. So he's praying, Lord, you show your authority over the wicked and those who thwart your purposes. And we know that God had chosen King David for his purposes. So what you will find characteristic these kind of prayers. David, David doesn't scheme to strike back. No, he calls on the Lord to fight against his adversaries. Not him, but the Lord. In, verse, in Psalms 20, uh, 35, he said this. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. You see. So vengeance is rightfully placed in God's hands. Corey Ten Boone, you know her. She's passed away now. A Jew. She was under severe persecution in World War II. She was placed in a concentration camp, and she said this, God will deal with sin and wickedness. He will finally eradicate it from this universe. Eradicate is a strong language. She said, Lord, whatever it takes in time, they will get what they deserve from you and not from me. Justice comes from you. So what does it say to us here? It says this. When you feel mistreated and you feel offended and your flesh wants to retaliate, this is what David does. Build an altar. Vent your emotions with these words that David spoke in Psalms 143. Let me read this for you. He said this. Lord, show me the way I should go. For to you I lift up my soul, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God, and may your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, O oh Lord, bring me out of trouble. Would you keep that psalm tied in your pantry of your heart? Psalm 143. Sometimes it is best to leave it at the altar. Okay, let's go back to the beginning of this chapter now, with that behind us. David's hiding out here, right? He's out here in the desert in a dry and weary land where there is no water. He is literally in a dry desert place, and with poetic language, he uses the metaphor of being physically thirsty to express 
his spiritual need. Listen to verse 1. I am yearning for you, Lord, like a tall, cool drink of refreshing water. My soul thirsts for you. Three times in these eight verses, he uses the expression, my soul, verse 1. My soul will be satisfied, verse 5. Verse 8, my soul clings to you. The term soul is used throughout Psalms. In the Hebrew thought, this is an expression of our whole being, the totality of who I am, my mind, my will, my emotions, all of me thirst for you, Lord. You are my greatest desire. A beautiful, savory Psalm 73 says this, Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth it has nothing I desire besides you. Beautiful. I received a note from um, Nan Milner. She's not back yet from up in Nashville. But she goes up there and she, she leads a, a Bible study. She, her husband was a pastor for 40 some years and she leads a Bible study in her 90s. She's a retired pastor's wife and so she leads a group of retired pastor's wife. She sent me a devotional down and inside of it she wrote this. She said, you can't live without water. She said, I cannot live without God. I thirst for Him. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying here. All of me wants you. Now turn over to Psalms 42. I want to compare the opening of this psalm to the opening of David's psalm. Notice the inscription there. This psalm was written for the director of music for the choir. You see the word again in style? This is a masculine. It's a instructional song for teaching. So the lyrics are words to teach and memorize. So they set it to music. Not sure who wrote the words, but we are sure that a descendant of Korah composed the tune of this song. Psalms 42. Look at verse 1. He begins like this. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. You know what, Angela? I can't imagine the original score sounding any more beautiful mm -hmm. than the song tune that you sang it to this morning, mm -hmm. As the Deer Pants for. Maybe in heaven I'll get to hear that one, but I just love that mm -hmm. song, song this morning. Mm -hmm. You see, what he's doing here, the writer likens a spiritually thirsty person to a deer. Notice, this deer has been on a chase. It's panting. It needs refreshing water. You see, poor Bambi has been hassled and pounded and has become dry. And in this psalm, the writer describes this person here, as we will see, who has been hassled and hounded and is drained and is spiritually dry. <coughs> now, what can we learn now about this person from these lyrics? From the background of the time frame of the psalm was written. This is interesting to learn. Like David, this person too is described as living away from the comfort of his home. Hundreds of years later, remember that than David's time. This is one of the psalms, later psalms, when the Israelites lived in captivity. Remember God had chastened the Israelites because of disobedience and he allowed the Babylonians to capture them and to take them away from Jerusalem. You have to understand, it was a culture shock for them. They were scattered among the Gentile pagan nations in various and sundry places. And the bond of fellowship among the people had been broken up. So they believed that this psalm was written in those years. And this is interesting to know that many theologians have come to the conclusion that this was written from this time frame because the first verse of the next psalm Psalm 43, you'll see it later. It opens up with the cry to be rescued from an ungodly nation. 
And what is interesting, in many Hebrew manuscripts, Psalms 42 and Psalms 43 constitute one psalm. And for some reason, they don't know, maybe for liturgical reasons, it had been divided. You will find it has exact language in both. So from chapter 43, we glean that they are living in the time of an ungodly nation. So with the understanding of the background here, this psalm was written for those displaced Israelites who were then living in a hostile environment, and they were viewed as peculiar people here. And he feels like a deer that's been hassled and hounded and has become dry in a faraway land. You see. Because as peculiar people, they're living in those pagan nations now, their diet was different than theirs. Right? They dressed unlike the others. They did not worship their gods, neither did they have the opportunity to go to their own temple and worship any longer. But I want you to understand they were not ashamed of their faith, for they knew who they were and whose they were. But over time, it took a toll on them, living in captivity. So this person here that is described is in that kind of situation. He's been ridiculed long enough. He grew spiritually depleted, and he felt bone dry like that dear Bambi. This dear man felt that way. He was targeted. He was antagonized. And so he cried out, look at verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where is your God? Verse 9. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by this enemy? Verse 10. My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Day in and day out, they're in his face. They're sneering. They're saying, show me where is your God. You see that golden bull over there sitting? That's Baal. He's the God of rain and harvest. Uh, you want us to show us all our other gods? But where is your God? You believe in the living God. Where is he? You see? You can't even show us where he is. You see, they could not understand a God with divine essence. That our God is omnipresent, who is everywhere and ever-present. You see, because our God cannot be contained, you cannot put God in a box and then move him around, you see. He's the living God. And I love the way the psalmist affirms this in Psalms 139. He says, Where can I go from this? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the day, and if I settle on the far eastern side of Florida by the sea, he's there, isn't he? He's with us this morning, isn't he? He's in our midst this morning. Praise the Lord. So you see, this dear, displaced believer, he does have a confident trust in God that he's present with him. We know that because he calls on the Lord. He's praying. He must believe and assure that God is listening on the other end. He knows God's with him. He knows God hears him. But still, this situation is not easy, is it? To live like this. He's trying to be long-suffering. And he's been suffering way too long now. So he looks within himself. And he wonders and he repeats this question in this Psalm 42 three times, verse 5 and 11. And then when you include chapter 43 at the end of that as well, he says this. This is how he feels. So, why are you downcast on my soul? Why so disturbed within me? In other words, he's wondering, why do I feel so agitated like a sheep that's downcast? Like a sheep that has toppled over on its back and it's straining and it can't get up. I feel downcast. I'm agitated. I'm straining, you see. 
I believe the root of this, his agitation is twofold. One, understandably, he's living in a polluted environment, isn't he? And the downcast sheep there rolling on his back down in the ground and in the dirt feels like, I've been straining so long, you know what? <sighs> Please help me. I need a bath. Get me up. I need a bath. <laughs> and he's so drained and he's so de dehydrated there as he's straining. This poor sheep needs refreshment for his soul and he longs to be in the presence of the Lord. Because in the presence of Jehovah, the flood of evil cannot reach me there. I need to be in the presence of the Lord. So this is why this poor downcast sheep has cried out in verse 2, My thirst, my soul thirsts for God, the living God. When can I go and meet with him? I need to meet with him. I need to be refreshed. I need a bath. Let me answer the question this morning. When do you go and meet with God? Is it Saturday night, 6 o'clock? Or Sunday morning, early, 8.30, or maybe 10 or 11? Well, you always need that place of refreshment, don't you? Not just in times of drought, but to be refilled. To be spiritually refreshed, regularly, consistently. Perhaps you find your oasis while walking on the beach or sitting on your porch or while driving in your car, right? Somewhere where there's no distractions. These times can be so refreshing, as if cool water has been poured over you. Have you experienced those times? I was reading an article from Christianity Today. It states that the greatest challenge of modern woman is the matter of muchness and manyness. Muchness and manyness. I'm telling you this. This can happen at any age. Let me tell you about it. Not February, you see. When it rains, it pours, and this can be draining both physically and spiritually. Is it your desire to experience a deeper intimacy with the Lord? If it is, there are steps you must commit to to tap into his presence. You see, I call these steps thirst quenchers. You'll see them in both of these psalms. They're right here. What are these thirst quenchers in the times and in keeping ourselves hydrated and to be spiritually refreshed? Many of you last week made a commitment. You took the first step. You, you drank from the well of the living water that Renee spoke about this morning. And then there were many of you who recommitted your lives to the Lord. And yes, we all need to continually draw from the source of living water that never runs dry. We just need to tap into it. You see? Because, listen to this, deep intimacy with God is the outcome of a deep desire. Continually, we need to make efforts to draw from the source of living water. Now, in both of these psalms, it's going to teach us what these thirst quencher steps are. First, Psalm 63. Turn back to Psalm 63. <coughs> Remember, he prayed at the beginning. He begins with a prayer. He says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I want you to know in the early New Testament church, this psalm was read every morning. This psalm was noted as the morning psalm. Psalm, so was Psalm 3, and so was Psalm 5. Listen to what Psalm 3 did with both. He said, I lie down and sleep, and I wake again, because the Lord sustains me. Another prayer in Psalm 5, he said, In the morning I lay my request before you, and I wait in expectation. Morning Psalms. You see, he jump-started his day by communing with God through prayer. I've come to realize in my study of the Psalms through these writings of the Israelites, that these writings, all the book of Psalms, were not just about God and his relationship to his creation. They're not only about their relationship with God in, in Israel, but I also have come to understand very much as revealed through these Psalms, the longings of the writer's hearts to know their God more intimately in their relationship with him.
You see that by the writer's words through the Psalms. And you understand, I told you a few weeks ago, there are many more prayers in the book of Psalms than there are Psalms of praise, you see. So they pray. And David understood. He's praying. He's going to jumpstart his day with prayer. And it's just as beneficial to jumpstart your day with prayer as it is to jumpstart your day with water. You know that even sleep can literally drain you, right? Isn't it the truth? You lose a significant amount of fluids through the night. Hydrating will perk you up in the morning. Dr. Andre suggests a tall glass of water after sleeping. He said it kicks your energy level and metabolism right into gear. Well, that would be using smart water. I would use smart water for that. <laughs> so we read here in, in Psalm 63, David taps daily into the presence of the Lord by communing with the Lord. All right? He finds his soul is refreshed when he taps into the presence of the Lord. Now, I also want to recommend to you prayer with fasting. Women testify that during seasons of fasting with prayer, they not only lose weight, but they experience a deeper sense of God's presence. You see, fasting in the Hebrew thought meant to cover the mouth. Fasting covered the mouth. But fasting along the prayer is this. It is much more than abstaining from food. Because with just fasting, we detach ourselves from the earth. That's the flesh. And with prayer, we attach ourselves to heaven. That's the spiritual man. So the purpose of fasting with prayer is always to attain some spiritual end. Well, that's just food for thought. I recommend you prayer and fasting to commune with the Lord in a special way. <coughs> so commune with the Lord consistently, you'll see, among the psalmists. Now, here's another way to quench your thirst. Verse 2. Notice what David's longing for. He says this. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Out there in the desert, he misses his church. Now remember, he lived in the palace. He was only steps from the tabernacle. Actually, it was a tent. Did you know that? It was a tent. The temple wasn't built yet. David had the vision, and he accumulated much of the materials. But his son, King Solomon, oversaw the building of the of the temple. And in the meantime, as king, David followed God's instruction and he did set up a worship center there in Jerusalem, a tent on Mount Zion, where they placed the Ark of the Covenant. You see, God had chosen his people and God had chosen his place. Unlike the pagan gods that could be picked up and moved around, this would be a dwelling place. This would be the house. And the worship center would be a gathering place for his covenant people to meet with him, to offer up prayer and praise and sacrifices and see his glory and power manifested in the form of a cloud, just as they experienced it in the wilderness. David loved the house of the Lord. You see? It was the first IHOP. It was the first international house of prayer. Come hungry and thirsting and leave happy and filled. My pastor grew up used to call our church a filling station. Gas and go, you say. I love Psalms, Psalms uh, 27. David favored the house of the Lord. This is what he wrote in Psalm 27. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I might dwell at the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. And I remember one of the first uh, Psalms, for Psalms 122, I learned as a little girl, some, I memorized verse 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Are we in the same Sunday school class? What's that one? I know what you're thinking here. She's supposed to say this all this wonderful thing about church. She's a pastor's wife. You see? I'm telling you, 
telling you this. I speak out of many years of experience. And this I know. I've been to the diner, and the diner is good. <laughs> Amen. And I have visited a few churches in my lifetime, and there were times that I felt unsatisfied when I left because the word was watered down, and the word that came forth did not nourish my soul. I was looking for a church to be fed in that morning. I wouldn't go back to that time, you see. But over the course of living here 15 years, I can tell you I've been in a few of your churches. Yes, I have, for special occasions. And I can tell you this, I understand why you frequent your diner. You see, if I didn't have a church, I'd go and sip and sup with you too. You see, the diner is good. And David <coughs> misses the sanctuary out there in the desert. Now, let's look at Psalm 42. Does he miss the sanctuary as well? Not only does he miss the sanctuary, he misses the people. Listen to Psalm 42.4. He writes, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throngs. You see? It was a gathering place for God's people. And we learned through the study of the Psalm of Ascents that it was a time to come and connect and reconnect on a regular basis to meet and eat and greet as well as being fed. Now right here, I want to feed into this psalm another psalm that the sons of Korah, some descendant of Korah wrote, about their yearning and their desire and their love for the house of God and for the people and for the work of the Lord. Listen to Psalm 84, just a few verses I'm going to give you. Read the whole psalm this week. Listen to this. They wrote, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Sound familiar? Isn't that a beautiful psalm about his love for the house of God? I get the picture. This psalm is here. He longs to be in the presence of God. And church is the place where he finds strength to strength as he's encouraged, as he sits in the pew, shoulder to shoulder with God's people. And also, he's found a place of ministry that he misses from being not in his church. He was a doorkeeper. Oh, he worked with the finances. Or maybe he sometimes would usher. Maybe you would greet or usher. Or maybe you teach, you see. If you want to feel a part, you take part. And some of you today, I believe that you may be in church, but you're not all in it, you see. You're not all in. Finding your place in a church, I'm telling you, is a beautiful thing. So back here in Psalms 42, he longs to be refreshed. He misses his church. He misses his people. He misses his involvement. Now let's turn back over to Psalm 63, where we left off. I told you that David missed the sanctuary. Guess what he does? He can't be in church, can he? He's out in the wilderness. Let's read verses 3 through 5. Now he's got a good reason for not being in church, right? All right. He decides to have church right there in the wilderness. Look at verse 3 through 5. This is what he does. He says this, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands, right here, in the desert. Mm -hmm. My soul will be satisfied, right here, as with the riches of food. With singing lips, you hear me, Lord? I'm having church, right mm -hmm. here. My mass will praise you. He worships, he praises, he sings, he even lifts upward his palms in prayer in the same manner that the priest 
would raise their hands towards God in the sanctuary. His wilderness experience becomes a worship experience. He's in the presence of the Lord, and he senses the presence of the Lord because the Lord <coughs> inhabits our praises. David sensed the power and the glory of the Lord. Yes, you can have church anywhere. That's right. And that's wonderful. But it should never take the place of gathering together in your house of worship. That was by God's design, the church. You see, David took church with him. And he wants more of it. You take church home with you, never in place of. You take it home with you. I'm going to tell you something. My young son taught me something years ago. We were pastoring as a young couple, and it was before our career in the Air Force in the chaplaincy. And we were living in Maryland, and one day I was at my kitchen. And I could hear, the window was open, and I could hear my son, my four-year-old son. I looked out the back kitchen window, and there he was, standing on a stool behind the barbecue pit, pretending to hold an open book. Some of you mothers, you see this that. <laughs> he looked like his father standing behind a pulpit, let me tell you. <laughs> Jared knew just what to say. He's holding the Bible. He's praising up the storm. He's going, pray God, pray God, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> and he did everything but pass the plate to his sister on the ground. <laughs> You know, this thrilled me to see. He took church home with him. You see, church is where he acquired the desire. He acquired the desire in church, and he just wanted more of it. He wanted more of it. And I'm telling you this, this year he's working towards his ordination. Aww. Let's look at Psalm 63. Finally, one last thirst quencher here. Renee, you mentioned that you can't live without water very long, right? Can't live without food maybe four to six weeks. Maybe six minutes without oxygen. <laughs> but there's one thing that most everyone agrees is impossible to live without, and that's hope. You can't live without hope. You see, David is filled here with hope as he taps into the presence of the Lord, as he clings to the Lord and his promises described here in verse 7 in the most beautiful poetic language, verse 7 he writes, Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. David, there in the wilderness, out of his worship time, mm -hmm. he moves and filled with hope. He's a king. He's a warrior. Yet the most tender way here, he pictures himself in the shadow of his wings mm -hmm. as a baby chick that sees his mother with her wings outstretched and instinctively runs under her wings and clings to her for protection. She is his hope as she drew near to her heart and as he drew near to the Lord. This thought fills his soul with hope and he declares, Yes, Lord, in your presence I have hope because he opens saying, You are my help. You are my help, and I cling to you. You are my hope. It refreshed him. He finds strength being in the presence of the Lord. And I tell you what, when there's nothing else to cling to, and you have the Lord, you can hope in him, you see. Amen. One day I was typing the word hope. You see it there. For a second I thought, how the words, the letters of that word reminded me of the formula for water. I saw H2O, he is hope. Isn't hope for the soul like water for the body? 
Both are refreshing. Refreshing to you. There's the two. Refreshing to you. You see, when I meditate on the promises of God's word and these savory psalms here, they bring refreshment to my soul. As I read through Psalms 23, every line is a promise, and I meditate on it, it brings refreshment to my soul. And as I have read so many psalms to you so far, and remind you of some very refreshing psalms that can be refreshing to your soul, always remember, God is an ever-present help in the time of trouble. There's hope. Refreshment to my soul. And that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Wow, that gives me hope. Refreshment to my soul. Lord, you hem me in from behind and before and you place your hand upon me. This gives me hope and refreshment to my soul. You see, he brings refreshment and hope. He'll fill you with hope in his presence and in his word. Why we never give up. Never give up. That's why David said, Lord, you are my help. I declare, you are my help. That's why I believe that the book of Psalms is a reservoir. Filled. It gives us strength and spiritual encouragement in our lives. I close with this because... We left that sheet down on the back. Let's turn over to Psalm 42, verse 5. His only hope is to look up into the face of the good shepherd there lying on his back. He's downcast. Who brings hope? How does he find refreshment? Three times he declares, verse 5. 11, in Psalms 43, he says this. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And then, following that, he likens this experience of finding hope in the presence of God to a place on the east side of Jordan where the river flows and there is a waterfall. And he says in verse 7, this is how I feel like when I am refreshed and find hope in the Lord. Verse 7, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers, he says, have swept over me. You see, when he became hope-filled, he felt as if Niagara Falls had washed over him where he was. And he was fully saturated. And he closes that psalm here with another verse of full of hope. Verse 8. Take this with you. By day, the Lord directs his love. And at night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. To the God of my life. Tapping into his presence. He take him with, he's with you day and night. I look to the Lord for strength. I will seek his face always. The psalmist said. Look to the Lord in his strength. And seek his face always. One church... Sunday after church. The service was barely over. I was walking down the hallway at the base chapel. You can still hear the organ was playing. And Lynn stops me there in the hallway. She looks me in the eye, she takes hold of my arm, and she says, Where can we go and meet with God? That was her exact words. Ming was our Christian education director. Her office was in the wing of the base chapel. We were just in church. And she wants to know, where can we go and meet with God? I said, Lynn, what do you mean? 
him. She says, I just want to get closer to him. She says, like you are. Like Mary is. Like Karen is. She was naming all the ladies in her wings. I just want to get closer to him. Where can we go and meet with God? Well, I knew we couldn't do it that morning. She's closing up that session for the next session. She's the Sunday school director. So I asked her the question, Lynn, when can we go and meet with God? When can we go? She said, I know. How about Tuesday morning around 9 o'clock? Because my kids would be in school and her kids would be in school. And I said, and where can we go and meet with God? And she said, how about the room above my office? Up in the lounge. I can tell you this. On Tuesday morning, I walked up the steps to the upper room. Mm -hmm. It was nine o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I could hear music being softly played on her, her little tape player. And I walked through the door and I saw there was Lynn down on her knees. She wasn't waiting on me. She was waiting on the floor. There. And I knelt beside her at her couch. She had her head bowed. She had her eyes closed, kneeling. As I knelt beside her, I said, Lynn, would you do this? Just call out his name. Just call in the name of Jesus. Tell him what you're longing for. Just tell him. Go ahead, Lynn. She said, Lord Jesus, fill me. Fill me with your presence. Fill me till I overflow. And I tell you what, Lynn started to just praise the Lord. And she began to praise his name. And then her praise turned into a worship. And her hands that were once folded then became a praise, and then it became a worship, as if she's saying, Lord, all of me wants you. All of me wants you. I'm telling you, we can feel the presence of the Lord in that place. We never looked at our watches. We were there over an hour that morning, because we were the presence of the Lord and I'm telling you this, once you taste of this, you'll want more. Because I believe it's a taste of what heaven's going to be like. To be in the presence of the Lord. We drunk in and continued to drink in as he poured out into our hearts. He gave us the desires of our heart. I was refilled. She was filled. It was this wonderful visitation from the Lord that morning. And I want us right now, in this time, as Angela sings, in the presence of Jehovah. In the presence of Jehovah. Would you reach out to him in your own way? Let's make this, in closing, our oasis this morning. In the presence of the Lord.